going to make this bitter melon tofu stir fry. And um, I hope along the way that I will give you a ton of variations so that everyone can make the stir fry according to their taste and their preferences. Um, and my secret mission, and the people I meet up probably don't know this, but my secret mission for you is to try to inspire you to grow um, something new or maybe to even start a garden for the first time if you've never done that. All right, so we're just gonna go ahead and get started. Um, the recipe was posted on in the meetup info. And, uh, and like I said, it's also um, in the Chinese Kitchen Garden book. Um, and I'm pretty much gonna follow that recipe, making variations along the way. Okay. This tofu and bitter melon stir fry, we're going to start by making a marinade. So um, we're going to start with two teaspoons of minced garlic. I never listen to my own directions. So this is more than two teaspoons. This is probably, I don't even know, maybe like three cloves. I feel like when I'm cooking with garlic, everything kind of starts with two cloves. And then if it's something that really requires a lot of garlic, I usually just go for more. Um, and then, of course, there are a lot of people who would say, once you've accomplished that, add more. So if you really like garlic, add more. This is about two teaspoons, and I'm not going to chop it for you because you know how to chop garlic. But instead, I am going to use my time to talk about planting garlic, because like I said, that's my secret mission. Garlic is so easy to grow in the garden. And I will tell you that the garlic that you use in your dish is not going to be like that sort of semi-flavorful elephant garlic you get at the supermarket. This is garlic that I harvested last summer. And I actually save, when I dig it up, I usually save the nicest bulbs to plant again in the fall. And I'm just gonna show you real quick how to do this because it is super easy and it's actually really fun too. So this is, um, Okay, I'll tell you that about that in a sec. So all you do is you separate the cloves out and you don't need to remove the um, papery coverings. You just separate the clove out, make a hole in the ground with a little tip up, six inches deep. And you do this in my zone. I always have October 15th in my calendar. That's when I plant my garlic. And then I'll plant them like maybe, you know, eight inches apart so that, you know, maybe like this far apart. You start it around mid-October in my zone. Um, it starts to take root in the soil. You might see some green leaves start to come up. And then um, next year at this time, the, the garlic will really start to grow. Um, this, is, this is what they call hard neck garlic. There's hard necks and there's soft necks. And these hard necks, the neck is hard, um, just before they're ready to be harvested, it will send up a flower stalk and the flower stalk will grow up and it will kind of curl. And that's kind of, it's actually really easy because when you see that garlic scape or that flower stalk, when you see that curly guy come up, you know that very soon your garlic's gonna be ready to be harvested. And the bonus is you can clip off that garlic scape and you can use that garlic scape um, in so many different kinds of dishes. Um, I like to pickle them too. That's also a, real, a really good way to use garlic scapes. But um, if that interests you, then you know, look up garlic scape recipes and see what you can um, find. And know that you can probably find them at a good farmer's market, but it would be so easy to grow on your own. Okay, back to my marinade. So we have the garlic in here. And I'm gonna add two teaspoons of rice wine. This is Shaoxing rice wine. Um, it's basically a, it's basically a seasoned rice wine and it says two teaspoons, but I'm going to tell you something. I'm not even going to measure. I did bring, I did bring out a spoon for effect, but I, I'm actually not going to measure this either. If you don't know how this tastes, if you don't know how the other ingredients, um, are really going to work for you, then I would suggest you follow the recipe, but I'm just going to kind of, um, budget. So around two teaspoons, that's about one. That's about more than another one, but that would be good enough. All right, so I got my rice wine in here. We need a little soy sauce, so two teaspoons of soy sauce. That's about one. That's about two. And 
And then you need a little sesame oil. And this is a toasted dark sesame oil. Sesame oil is my favorite. I love the flavor so much. So this is something that you would think I would use a lot of, but I don't really because sesame oil has a really strong taste. So um, I pretty much always just use a little drizzle. So that's about right. You see how easy it is? You really, I mean, you really cannot go wrong. The only thing I think you could kind of go wrong with is using too much soy sauce um, because it, that could make your food kind of salty. Um, and speaking of which, the next two ingredients would be pepper. So I'll add some pepper. And then salt. But I'm going to skip the salt because number one, I almost always skip the salt or sometimes I like to season my food with some um, salt right before I eat it just for um, for taste but I usually don't cook with a lot of salt I don't really have like a taste for overly salted food plus I have all that um, soy sauce in here so for me I'm done I got my marinade ready and next step is to press the tofu and I will tell you about that Oh, and if you don't like tofu, then don't use tofu. Then you can use any other protein or you could just throw in different. Okay, so for example, I really like, um, like if you imagine maybe a thinly sliced flank steak marinated, marinated in this marinade, um, and then you use that instead of tofu, or uh, you could use pork, chicken. Oh, you could even use, you could use um, ground pork or ground chicken, um, you know, it's really, you could, it's, it's totally up to you. Uh, we often do tofu because my daughter's a vegetarian and it's just really tasty and kind of good for everyone. So this is, this is extra firm tofu. And the only reason I'm able to hold it up like this is because I already drained it in the sink. If you don't really use tofu a lot, you're going to have to open this up over the sink because it, is, it sits in water. And tofu is kind of like a sponge. Like really the way I look at it is kind of like a sponge. It's really, oops, I'm already dumping tons of water out. It's, um, you, you want it, so that's why you want to press the tofu. Um, I have all this nice marinade that I just made, but it's not gonna soak into the tofu if the tofu's like already waterlogged. So you kind of want to squeeze the water out so that when you throw it into the marinade, it will suck up the marinade. Does that make sense? Okay, so I am a wannabe engineer. So I like to, um, my brother-in-law made this board, by the way, it's so gorgeous. It makes all food look good when you serve it on this. I like to, um, because I think I'm fancy, I like to kind of hold this over the sink and prop it up with a little prop and then, and then maybe I put a towel on top and then I stack it up with a cast iron pan so that it presses the tofu. And I think it's brilliant because all the water drips, drains right into the sink. Um, but literally last night, my daughter was like, why are you doing that mom? That's so dumb. And so what she did instead was she just found a clean kitchen towel. So just find a clean kitchen towel and you know, just literally wrap it up and um, she put and put the cast iron pan on top and it will just, it will squeeze a lot of the water out. One day I was super um, rushed for time and I forgot to press the tofu. So I literally just went over the sink and squeezed. Can you see the water dripping out? I don't know if you can, but if you imagine pressing this tofu first, you can imagine how when you then put it in the marinade, it would better um, soak it up. So I am going to pretend that I just soaked that tofu for, I mean, um, pressed that tofu for an hour. This is, has already been pressed. So I'm going to just, and actually I'm gonna, I'm gonna just use half of a block because I have a really small pan today. Um, so I'm only gonna use half of the um, ingredients. So we just have to slice this up, or not slice it up, but we're gonna cut it into cubes. 
So we'll just cut it into cubes. We'll throw it in the marinade. That looks good. I'm trying to be careful with my beautiful board. All right. Then I'm just going to kind of, let me kind of just stir this up a little bit. It smells so good because honestly, sesame oil on anything to me just is so yummy. Sesame oil, garlic, and a bunch of good stuff. You can't beat that. So that is just going to sit here. That's going to sit here for a while. So we'll let that sit there. All right, let's do what's next, which is to prepare the bitter melon. Bitter melon, oh, before we prepare the bitter melon, let's talk about the bitter melon. I read a comment on the meetup information yesterday. Somebody mentioned something about how it's a frequent topic of discussion on like a, I think it was like a diabetes board and a message board or a Facebook group, or I don't even know what it was. Um, because bitter melon, a lot of research has been done that shows bitter melon is really good for lowering um, blood sugar um, in people with diabetes. But, you know, if that's something you want to explore, I'm not a doctor. I don't want to give medical advice. Talk to your doctor. Um, and, you know, you can, you can look it up. There's, there's a lot of work that's being done right now. I know people who are literally just throwing this in a juicer and juicing the whole thing. Um, but we're not going to do it that way. We're, we're going to cook it the way it's traditionally done. But, okay, so here are, this is Chinese bitter melon. Another person left a comment yesterday and mentioned something about the little bitter melon. If you know what I'm talking about, there is a, an Indian bitter melon that's about maybe this size, just like this little guy. It looks like a little hedgehog. It's actually so cute. And you know it's an Indian bitter melon because the bumps are not like wide and kind of smooth like this. They're really bumpy and they're small and um, they, just, they just look very different. People say the Indian bitter melon is a little more bitter. Um, and my husband today asked me if there is a way to make it less bitter. Um, and there are, there are ways. We're using garlic and black beans because that balances out the bitter. So it really doesn't taste that bitter, that bitter. Um, you could add peppers and it would kind of have the same effect. Or if you want to, you could like salt it and sweat it like you would salt cucumbers. Um, and that kind of tames it a little bit. Or if you want to try it and you like pickles, I feel like a very um, easy way to get into the world of bitter melon is to make a pickle, like a quick pickle. Um, that way you have that yummy pickle flavor with just the bitterness at the end. Um, that's a good way. Um, we're not using the chat, but quick contest, okay? 10 seconds. Name as many things as you can to your partner or just into the air that are bitter in the culinary world. Go. Okay. I hope you were able to think of some things. Um, I, ha I get I feel a lot of pressure when questions are asked to me like that. But you know, alcohol. I mean, those things are bitter. Um, green pepper, which I compare to bitter melon a lot. Green pepper is bitter. Um, I don't know. Too much pressure. I can't even think right now. But hopefully, you guys were able to think of something. Um, Oh, dark chocolate. Dark chocolate is a, uh, a bitter taste. So in the culinary world, there are a lot of delicious things that are bitter. So I'm telling you this because when I tell you that this is legit bitter, I don't want you to be like, well, why would I eat that then? It's actually very flavorful. And I'm going to show you how to use this. So bitter melon, oh my gosh, it's so interesting when you cut it up. And again, I'm going to have the recipe. So I'm only going to cut one up. Um, I'm just going to cut the ends off, and if you can't see very well, I will show you. Um, I'm going to cut the ends off, then I'm going to cut it lengthwise. Okay. This, you can see that the seeds inside are like really gigantic. 
the trickiest part about growing bitter melon, if you want to grow bitter melon, is that um, the seeds have a really thick and hard seed coat. So you need to either kind of nick it a little bit or file it down so that when you put it in the ground or in a pot to start inside, it will actually germinate. It will break the seed coat and actually germinate into a plant. But once you do, it is, um, it is a vigorous vining plant and you can have all the bitter melon you want. This is what it looks like on the inside. Actually, I am gonna cut this one just because I wanna see what this one looks like on the inside. Oh, I was hoping to show you a surprise, which is that when bitter melon starts to get, um, starts to get overly ripe, this stuff inside, which is kind of spongy, turns red and goopy. It kind of has the texture of like roasted red pepper and it actually becomes sweet, which is crazy, like legit sweet. But neither of these are, the, both of these are just like perfectly prime eating right now. So this spongy stuff, it does not taste good. So we're gonna take a spoon and I'm gonna just scrape it out. So we scrape out this spongy stuff, scrape out all the seeds. And we will be ready to go in just a moment. It's very easy to scrape out. The trick with Asian vegetables, if you want to cook more with Asian vegetables, is knowing how to prepare the vegetable. I think this is this is the the this is the biggest this is I don't want to say it's a battle because it's not really a battle. That's not the right expression. That's the trick is just to know how to prepare the vegetable, which portion you use, how you use it, either in Chinese recipes if you want to or in your own. Um, and that is why I wanted to write my book the way I did so that um, it sort of demystifies it. So these are all hollowed out and we are ready to go. So I'm just going to cut, cut these into little slices. You can always recognize bitter melon um, in a recipe because you will see these little C-shaped pieces kind of bumpy on one side, kind of like a cool rainbow, kind of like a cool bumpy green rainbow. All right, so I'm gonna cut these into slices. There's actually another interesting way to cut bitter melon if you don't wanna do it like this, but I think you do wanna do it like this just because it looks better in the dish. But if you wanna, if you want to go even faster and, um, and you don't really care about the way that looks, you can literally just hold the bitter melon and cleave off chunks. I don't even think that's easier, but that's another way you can do it. And then you have these big chunks that you can put in your dish. But I like to cut it into little C-shaped segments. All right, so that's done. We have cut the bitter melon. if you want an alternative to the bitter melon. Okay, next secret ingredient. These are the black beans, black beans. I went to two stores and really struggled to find them. And finally, I did find a bag. This is what it looks like. You might be, not be able to read that. And I couldn't either, unfortunately, but there's English on the back. Do not ever be scared to go to the Asian supermarket. You can spend all day long there if you want and you can turn everything over and you can read the ingredients and then kind of figure out how that might taste and how you might use that um, to recreate a Chinese recipe or 
how you might use it in your own dishes. Um, but, you know, don't be scared to go there. There's English on almost everything. There's, there's um, you know, because if it's sold in America, at least in America, if it's sold in America, I would think that most things would be marked at least with, you know, the nutritional information, which will give you some information. I think that most things would, would be um, labeled in English. These are salted black beans. Uh, and I can't tell you what section to find them in because it was kind of random. I mean, the, yeah, I mean, it's kind of random. There was like bouillon and there were salted vegetables and jars of things. So I usually find them in bags. And the, the second store I went to had two um, brands and both were in these bags. So it's just, it's just black bean, water, salt, ginger, orange peel, and spice. So um, you can actually see the little salt crystals on this. So um, in the recipe, and you probably do want to do this, you want to take your beans and, you know, just put them in a little strainer, rinse them under water, and then, um, then you'll be ready to chop them. And they actually look like little black, they're just like little black beans. I was trying to think of how to describe this, and I would probably describe it, I would probably describe it in a way like a caper, because you know how like, um, if you, you know how like maybe, you know, your ideal smoked salmon sandwich on like a toasted bagel with some cream cheese might have capers on them. This kind of does, to this dish, what a caper does for that. It's really strong. Like if I eat one, which I will, um, like it's activated all my sal salivary glands and um, it's, it's strong and really tart. And, um, and so it's tart and salty at the same time. This, this brand actually has um, orange peel in it. And this is really, tart and salty. It's like, it's, it's really good though. Okay. I'm gonna have to swallow like five times. I probably shouldn't have done that. I'm gonna put this down and I'm just gonna chop it. Um, you just don't want it to look like, um, you just don't want it to look like a whole bean. So it doesn't have to be like super fine, but I would say just kind of, um, just kind of coarsely chopped would be fine. Well, whatever, forget what I said, do it how you want to do it. I like to sort of see a bean, but not like, I like to coarsely chop this. All right, that's that. And we will soon be ready to go. Oh, when I was nervous that I wasn't going to be able to find the black beans, if you can't find these black beans, rest assured that an Asian supermarket, and I think even bigger non-Asian supermarkets, um, will have black bean garlic sauce. Um, I haven't tasted this, so I don't know what it's going to taste like. Actually, I could. Should I demonstrate trying all these foods for you? Um, and you can just add this instead. I mean, obviously when you cut up and mix up your own stuff, especially stuff that you've grown yourself in the garden, um, it's just, it, it has um, like a more distinct and robust taste, but, and plus you can control the salt and you can control that whole situation. But if you, if you, if you wanna make this recipe and you can't find these ingredients, then just get a jar of black bean sauce. You know, it's probably like, it's like a stir fry sauce. You just mix it in towards the end of your cooking time and it'll probably be fine. All right, so that's that. We are just about ready to cook this thing. Okay. This is my special little camp stove that I actually bought at the Asian supermarket. And you're probably like, why would they sell that at the Asian supermarket? It's actually such a nice little portable stove um, because if you've ever heard of hot pot, um, you can act, it's kind of like a fondue with a pot of, um, broth that you, you can put seafood or very thinly sliced, like, like shaved meats, throw that in there, throw vegetables in there 
and kind of just like cook and eat and it's really fun it's like a it's like a family or friend kind of thing um and you can share like you're sitting here and your friend's sitting there and you're cooking over the hot pot or you can do individual um dinners and that's why they have this at the asian supermarket so just thought i would share that with you let's go ahead and get this thing started Whoa, okay. All right, lights up really easily and I did not burn my eyebrows off. Pan's gonna get hot and we can add a little oil. This is just vegetable oil, but add whatever oil you like. Um, I don't know if I would do coconut oil because that's gonna just affect the flavor of what you're doing here. So I wouldn't add olive oil, but you know, any other kind of neutral oil. Pan's hot, add your oil. It says two tablespoons. And sometimes when I try to do stir fries, I actually follow that. I'm always tempted to use less oil because I just feel like, ah, oil. But um, my parents shock me with how much oil they use in their food. All right, so I'm gonna add the, the black beans and let that just stir around until fragrant. 10 seconds, not long, we don't need a long time. Stir around. And then we are ready to add the bitter melon. So we're not like a fancy Chinese restaurant with enormous flames. So we don't, you know, that kind of like get sucked into the walk and you're all dramatic like on, t on shows, like cooking shows. So we don't really need to constantly be stirring things around, um, especially if you're trying to get like a nice crust on your food. So you don't need to constantly be moving your food around. Even though I'm, even though you're, even though you're tempted to, like I'm tempted to do that, even though I'm telling you you don't have to. Um, and actually, this is a new pan. It's it's a nonstick pan, and it's hard to even, um, it's hard to even stir things around with my spoon because it wants to just get pushed off. So I'll just flip it a little bit here and there. Okay, so it's turning bright green and beautiful. But if you were to eat this now you might find it a little um, not tender enough. So I would say the goal is uh, like a crisp tender, you know, but do it to your preference. This is what I keep saying is like, it's totally to your preference. My daughter works at a restaurant and um, she's been telling me about this woman who comes in and orders Brussels sprouts and says, I want them burned. If you don't burn them, I'm going to send them back. And I like that. I'm going to start saying that from now on because um, I like my roasted stuff really dark. Like I like my Brussels sprouts with a little bit of black on them. You know, when like your outer leaf is kind of crispy, like a kale chip. That's how I like mine. So do it how you want to do it. If I was trying to take a picture, I might stop it kind of soon but because it's nice and bright green, but I really like, um, I really like mine a little darker. So I'm just gonna let it keep going for a bit. It should not take very long. It should just really take a few minutes to get kind of crisp tender. Um, but I did wanna talk about my shirt. Isn't my shirt so cute? Can you see it? Hopefully I don't set it on fire. It says more boba, less hate. I saw this and I had to buy it, especially when I found out that it was um, a campaign to help um, teen, I think, I think it, it originated at a high school and it go, the money is going to promote the mental health of AAPI teenagers, um, which I just think is so important. And as we mentioned at the beginning, 
AAPI month is usually really fun, um, really celebratory, uh, but this year the climate um, among Asian American people is, um, it's, it's really demoralizing, it's scary. So, um, you know, if you can, if, you, if you're interested in supporting this campaign, you could look up more Boba Less Hate campaign, but don't just buy a shirt to buy it. I mean, you know, make sure you're supporting the campaign. Um, so make sure you're on that campaign site. There's another organization called Stop AAPI Hate, which does a lot of advocacy. Um, and they're a great charity to, uh, to donate to. So, and I believe we have a link to that in the meetup info and, and maybe in the chat, they can, they'll be able to put that in the chat too. Okay, so this is pretty much on its way. I like the way this looks and I am going to go ahead and add the tofu at this point. Gonna just give it one final stir, add it. Whoa, smart and remember to take down the smoke detector. My smoke detector is so sensitive, which is a good thing. I think this looks so good right now. Can you see it? I'm going to show it to you without setting my eyebrows on fire because I can't afford that. So right now I'm just going to move this around a little bit until the edges of my tofu dry out a little bit and kind of brown just a little bit. But besides that, we are pretty much done with this dish. Um, oh my gosh, this piece is just so... I just want to show you this piece, but how can I do that without burning myself? Like, I, I love how this looks. You see how, I don't know if you can see it, but you can see the kind of the brown um, edges brown sides. It actually looks really good. Okay, I'm going to turn this thing off because we are just about done. Um, not all Chinese food is served on rice or with rice, but this is a dish that is really good with rice. Um, and here's a secret if you don't know. I think it's safe to say that almost all Asian people use rice cookers to make their rice. This is my rice cooker that my mom bought me when I went to college, and that was a very, very long time ago. Um, it still is perfect. It makes perfect rice. You don't have to watch it. You can press your tofu, make your rice, and go walk away. Make yourself a drink, relax a little bit before you do this literally like seven minutes stir fry. Um, so that's your rice and here's how you would serve it up. You got your rice, you got your, your stir fry and you are pretty much ready to go. Um, let's see, I have a few minutes, which is good because I can tell you a little bit about this recipe and the other recipes. Um, most of the recipes in my book are my mom's recipes. And as we were working together to, I was, you know, I wanted to record all of her recipes and, um, you know, my publisher needed exact measurements, like the two teaspoons of minced garlic. Like we don't really measure garlic like that. Um, and you, you probably don't either, but the, you know, that's what a typical cookbook needs. It's like a standard, I guess. So you know, so I'm like, how much this and how much that? And she's like, just put it in. And I'm like, no, the publisher needs to know how many teaspoons. And then, um, you know, she started to get mad at me. And she's like, whatever you want, okay? Um, so that's why I tried to spend a lot of time talking about add more, add less. You know, we're, we're not baking. So it's not really like, you know, chemistry. We don't have to be super exact. Um, after you've made this recipe, you'll be able to know, oh, I really didn't like the taste of that wine in there. And maybe you won't use it next time. Or, oh, I did not like the soy sauce. So I might half the soy sauce and add a little something else instead. Um, so 
you know, lots of ability to just do things how you want to do things. Um, and like I said, you can really vary the, the dish too. Um, my daughter is probably going to eat this tonight for dinner. I have that other bitter melon and I'm trying to cut back on the carbs right now. So for example, I might slice up some beef, marinate that real quick since I have everything out and I might just have, and I might use a lot of the bitter melon and I might have myself a nice big bowl of bitter melon with a sliced beef in it. I might skip the rice today. Um, so, you know, lots of different things, lots of different ways you can try things. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I need to tell you. Um, should I try this? You want me to try this in front of your faces? Let's see how it tastes. And then I'll be able to make recommendations. All right, so this is, um, okay, so I can already tell, it's kind of like a paste. It's not really, you don't see like the big pieces of um, black beans. This is gonna be super salty, but I'm just gonna try it anyway. It tastes good though. Actually, it tastes really good. Um, it's super salty, but you probably would just use like a tablespoon of this or whatever in the whole dish. Um, and it's not as pretty. You don't see little black bits of uh, the black beans, but, um, but it's very tasty actually. So I would say if you can't find the black beans, go ahead and try a jar of, um, a jar of this stuff. And there were, so, there were so many, there are many, many brands that had this um, black bean garlic sauce. Thank you so much, Wendy, for the whole demo and all of the fun tidbits. I have some questions from our audience, if you are ready to answer. Okay. Our first one, um, approximately what temperature is it in your zone when you plant your garlic or any tips around growing your own garlic? So I'm in, I'm in zone like six, seven and um, mid October is about the time that it's, it's, I don't really wait for the temperature actually, cause it's always kind of, you know, it's always there. You, you can't really go wrong with garlic. Like, I feel like you can't go wrong with garlic. There was a time I totally forgot. And I think it was like late November, which really I thought was just way too late, but you know, worse comes to worse. You have like um, small, smaller bulbs, but it's actually pretty miraculous to put in a clove of garlic and then next summer you have a bulb of garlic. Um, you know, and some may be small, but it's, it's not, it's, it's a, you can't really fail. Um, I will say, if you're going to plant garlic, try to get seed garlic from, um, from a supplier. You can find any, you know, you can just look up online, mail order. Um, instead, and don't just, don't just get like elephant garlic at the store and plant that because you're, what you're really going for is flavor. If you were to do a taste test between the garlic you buy at the store and like heirloom garlic you grow yourself, it's so much more flavorful. You get, um, you know, my, like my garlic has, um, like, look how pretty that is. There's, it's, it, there's streaks of purple inside. It's just, it's gorgeous. And, um, and very flavorful. That's awesome. That was one of um, the questions from someone else, like if, how, if you should plant like store-bought or seed. So already ahead of yourself. Good job. Another garlic related question while we're here, chopped garlic versus smashed, um, why one over the other? Um, you could do smash meaning, meaning you just take, take the garlic and smash it and throw it in. I think that's what they mean. Yeah, you could do that. I mean, you could do, you could do that. And I will say when you're, when you're doing, when you're, um, okay, so that last part of the stir fry, when we were waiting for the, the, um, the tofu to kind of brown a little bit, we do have to be careful that the garlic doesn't burn because raw garlic burns really fast. So that's something we want to keep an eye on. I mean, if I'm like that lady and I just want my food to be burned and really blackened, um, by that point, my garlic will have blackened too and it probably will have um, turned bitter. So you just kind of want to be careful about that. Um, but you can definitely, I mean, 
you know, it, it depends on the dish. It depends on how, you know, I want my garlic infused in this. Black bean sauce is almost always black bean garlic sauce. So those two flavors like really go together. And so chopping it kind of incorporates it more. But if you're doing like, um, if you're just, you know, sauteing vegetables or something, you want that garlic flavor, then you could just, you know, crush the garlic, like smash it with the side of a knife and throw it in, um, kind of, you know, flavor the oil a little bit and then throw your vegetables in and cook it that way. Um, someone's going to get a big mouthful of garlic and hopefully they'll like it, you know, but it just kind of depends on what you're trying to do. Gotcha. Thank you. We have a question from Perry who asks, how can one identify if a bitter melon is underripe, ripe, or overripe when purchasing, if they don't have their own garden? <laughs> okay, okay. That's, that's a good question. I mean, if you're going to the supermarket, some, you know, I've never seen underripe or you wouldn't really know it's overripe until you cut it open and you see some of the, that inside part um, turn red. And when that happens, you can still eat it. You know, sometimes, I mean, if you've ever had like shishito peppers, you know that you're just like snacking on them. They're so good. And then suddenly you have one that just burns your head off. You know, it's like so hot. So every now and then with a the bitter melon, you will um, cut one open and it'll just be like super bitter. And it's just like, no, but generally it's, even if it's um, a little overripe, it's fine. I would say at the supermarket, what you have to worry about is that it gets gross. Like it gets like bruised and just icky um, as opposed to worrying about whether it's overripe or underripe and you know that's of course another reason why it's it's fun to to grow them yourselves but you if you're growing them yourself you will know that they're ready because um, they kind of take a glossier look so when they first start growing when they're smaller it'll kind of have like a dull color um, and they're ready when the when the bumps kind of smooth out a little bit and it's a little shinier. That's great. Um, another question from Neil. Um, if I were to salt the tofu, would it help pull some of the moisture out? Um, I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, maybe. I guess that kind of makes sense. And if you're going to cook a dish that is going to be salty anyway, then you could do that. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like pressing it is just as easy, but, and if you're going to salt it, then you wouldn't do something like this, which is already very salty. Um, so you would just kind of have to find that balance, I think. Um, yeah, I've, I haven't heard of that. It would make sense, but I think you would just kind of have to think ahead. Gotcha. Yeah, thank you. We have a couple questions about the rice wine. Um, could you show the label and then what's a good substitute? So my father uses sherry as a substitute and the, the label, well, it's, I don't know if you can see it. At the Asian supermarket, there is a whole aisle of Shaoxing cooking wine and it's full of Chinese letters, but there are always English letters that say what it is. So, um, you know, unfortunately I can't read Chinese either. Um, so you, you'll, you'll just look, there was Shaoxing and there was another type, but if you can find Shaoxing wine and not cooking wine, then that's supposed to be even better and less like trash as my daughter would call it. Um, but I, I've never been able to find plain Shaoxing wine that isn't Shaoxing cooking wine. It's basically a seasoned rice wine. So it's, um, it's the rice wine with, oh my God, I can't read this, but with some salt. So it's a cooking wine. Got it. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have another question. Um, Perry asked, any storage tips for the leftover fermented beans? Oh, um, I would just put them in the refrigerator. So yeah, I would just seal them, seal them up and um, you know, squeeze the air out and put them in the refrigerator. I think that would be just fine. 
That's how we usually do it because this is a lot. This will this will last you a long time. Gotcha. And then Terry asked, if you use the black bean paste, do you recommend using less garlic to start? This tasted really garlicky. Like this to me, it tasted really garlicky. And I guess you could try it and see what you think. It actually tasted really good. It tasted like fresh garlic. I mean, it tasted like someone made it. It's not too bad. The only thing I worry about jarred sauces like this is all the salt too. So if I were to use something like this, then I definitely wouldn't use salt um, just because there's probably so much in there. Um, but you know, I, I like garlic, so you know, I probably would add it. Or or I might not, honestly, because it tasted really garlicky. It really did. I do like to um marinade, marinate the um the protein. So I probably would kind of whip something up to marinate the tofu in. Cool. We have a question from Peter who asks, are there other vegetables that would go well with bitter melon that you might stir fry with it? Other vegetables? I mean, I think you could pretty much do anything. I mean, I have, I've just harvested some asparagus from the garden. It's asparagus time for gardeners out there. And um, I will say, can, can I talk about asparagus for a moment? Okay, asparagus is so fun. I love things that are fun and easy to grow. Asparagus is really easy because you buy the crowns, you you pop them in the ground, and asparagus is a, is like a labor of of it, it's like it, you have to really invest because it, once you put those asparagus crowns in the ground, you really have to wait several years. I mean, the first year you're not I don't know I can't remember what the rule is, but I think maybe you can't harvest the first year or something. And the second year you can harvest for like two weeks or something. And then the third year you can harvest for three weeks. I, it's something like that. You can look it up, but um, it really takes about five years to make those thick spears. And um, my asparagus is purple. So it always just looks so cool with the purple asparagus coming out of the ground this time of year. Anyway, I was thinking about, so I have a bunch of asparagus. I was thinking about throwing that in with the bitter melon as well. Um, you know, but whatever, I think, I think it's like whatever you like. It's like my mom, my mom said, whatever you want, if you want to do it, do it. Um, so feel free. I love that energy from your mom. It's, it's such a beautiful part of cooking, right? The improv and like feeling it out, learning what you like and right, exploring right. food. That's great. Um, let's see what other questions we've got. Anonymous asked, I have grown hard nut garlic multiple times and let it dry properly. I've never had luck with storing it well. Is there a special variety and best way to store it? Um, I mean, I, I guess just kind of a cool dry place. I, this, sometimes it starts, sometimes my garlic starts to shrivel up by now, but generally it's, I mean, this, I'm still using garlic from last summer. So you know, it's pretty okay. Oh, I, there was one year, there was one year, uh, this, this was a mistake. I let the garlic stay in the ground too long. I think I was just being really lazy. So, so by the time I got around to harvesting all the garlic, the little protective papers outside of each garlic clove started to, um, they all started to wear, wear away. Like they started to decompose and it was like raw garlic. Um, so I was like, okay, I'm not going to waste all this garlic. So I sliced them and dehydrated them and then put them in a food processor. And then you have your own garlic powder. So I feel like food preservation is really amazing, especially if, you know, you're finding your garlic won't store as long or something. Yeah. In my house, we roast it in the oven and it become, becomes like a little paste almost. And that stays in the fridge for quite a while. I love that. Oh yeah, you could use that real quick. You could use that up. Yeah. Quick. Yeah. Um, we have Rena who asks, how long does the tofu have to be pressed? Um, about an hour is good, but um, you know, sometimes you know, sometimes I I, know, I don't time it. So if I know that I'm cooking tofu, I will just press it and leave. And you know, if it's over an hour or whatever that's fine. And you know, it kind of depends on the dish you're cooking too. Like we like to make, my daughter likes to make baked tofu, um, you know, like marinated, basically exactly what I did with this tofu, except put it in the oven and bake it afterwards. It's delicious. And you can, you can make like a, you can, you, 
she likes to do, she, my daughter's very creative. Like I'm, I can cook, I can cook well, but I'm not creative. She likes to do like a, um, a rice bowl. So she'll make rice and she'll season the rice and she'll bake, she'll do baked tofu, put the cubes on top. She'll throw in, I don't even know what she throws in, various things. And then she'll make like a sriracha mayo and she'll like fry an egg and plop that on top and then snip some seaweed. I mean, it just looks beautiful. Um, so if you're baking tofu, then you, it would probably be a good idea to, to remove as much water as you can. Um, but if you're, you're making something kind of quick and it's gonna involve a lot of sauce, then it doesn't matter that much if your tofu is, is you know, kind of on the wet side. And some people don't care. Some people are like, I'm not wasting my time pressing tofu. So really it's kind of up to you and you, you can kind of do your own experiments too. Gotcha, thank you. I think that is um, most of our questions. And thank you so much for answering all of that. Um, before we go into closing remarks, is there anything else you wanna add? Um, no, no, it was, just, it was really great to show you all these things and hopefully, um, hopefully you're not overwhelmed by all my variations and ideas. Hopefully you just feel more like, okay, it's okay. I, I can, you know, do this and it'll be just fine. Um, very forgivable recipe and hopefully people are inspired to get out in the garden and, and do some growing in there. And thanks That's to me for having me. Yeah, of course. Thank you for being here. Um, and before we go, I wanted to share a couple slides. So become a meetup organizer. Um, find others who like to cook and share recipes on meetup and save 50% on your first subscription. You can go to meetupsavings.com for that. Um, also, we launched our podcast, Keep Connected with Meetup CEO um, earlier this year. So please take a moment, take out your phone, scan the QR code, or you can go to meetuppodcast.com. And then as a reminder, if you'd like to review a recap of this event and recording, uh, we'll have that on our Community Matters blog at meetup.com slash blog. And so thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you so much, Wendy, for sharing. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day. <laughs>